Well, good morning and welcome to Lincoln Hills Christian Church Worship Online. Uh, I am Webby Oglesby and I'm one of the ministers on staff at Lincoln Hills Christian Church. And we are so glad that you're joining us today in your living room or wherever you might be. Our prayer is that you will uh, lead this worship service this morning, wherever you go, whatever you be doing, uh, and understand that uh, we are here for you and we love you and we're so glad that you're joining us today for worship. Let's have a word of prayer and we're going to continue to worship Jesus Christ this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to worship. We know, Lord, that as uh, we are your children, we worship you wherever we are. And even though we're separated by some space today as we worship together, we know that you love us immensely in Christ Jesus. So, Lord, we ask your blessing on this service, on everything that happens in your name. Lord, we pray that you would bless all those that are hurting because of this virus that's in the world. And we ask that your blessing be on people and that soon we will be back in a normal situation. So, Lord, thank you for this opportunity to worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, 
Jesus, I say your name lifted I, oh God, you have done great things. You have done great things. Oh God, you do great things. You do great things. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, Jesus, so good, Lord. The prodigal is welcomed home. The sinner now is saying, For the God who died and came back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the dead. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is out. Oh, praise His name forever hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave so throughout eternity your song will be the same hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Jesus, yes, you are, Lord. And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, I see your skies, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you. Delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is out. Oh, praise His name forever hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave and all throughout eternity a song will be the same hallelujah Christ is risen from the grave Oh, we conquer the grave. We sing all throughout. And all throughout eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave.
Oh, you made a way. Yes, you did, Jesus. And on the day you called me in to heaven's sweet embrace, I see your skies, your open arms, the beauty of your face. Through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. God, we thank you for that promise. That if we are in Christ, your shed blood, your sacrifice, the life that you gave us will bring us home one day to be with you. And we thank you that we have the promise that not only uh, is that something that we can hold to for the life after, but even here right now, God, we know that you promised to be with us and to never leave us nor forsake us. And so we worship you with all that we are. We thank you just for this time, just to come together as the body of Christ in corporate worship, to sing together the praises of Jesus. We love you, we thank you, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for singing with us today, and I just believe that God hears us, even when we're uh, just spaced out like this, um, that we're, to, we're together in spirit, and that God uh, hears our cry when we cry out to him in worship. And so we just, um, just thank you for singing with us today. And we're moving into something known as communion, and what that is, um, is a time for us, just as believers, just to reflect um, and just to dwell on our relationship with Christ. And so we do that by taking bread and by taking juice, and these things represent uh, his body and his blood that was broken and shed for you and for me. And so here in just a moment, we're going to take that together as a church family. Do you ever do things without thinking? I do sometimes. I come to the church and I always light a candle when I go into my office. And then when I leave, most of the time I blow that candle out. I'd say all the time I blow it out, but sometimes at my house, I'll wake up at three in the morning and I'll think, did I blow that candle out? And then I'll drive to the church to make sure that I have done it, and I have. Uh, sometimes I drive places, I get there, and then I think, how in the world did I get here? Uh, we do things without thinking all the time. And it can be risky to do things without thinking. Paul is saying that in 1 Corinthians 11, 17, and 34. He began by criticizing them for their division when they came together. And then, after reminding them of how Jesus begins the Lord's Supper in the upper room, he said to them, In effect, think when you do this. Think when you take the Lord's Supper. Here's how he puts it in verses 28 and 29. It says, Examine yourselves. And only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body and drink judge, they drink judgment against themselves. He's saying to examine yourself. Don't let this be just another time where you eat bread and drink juice, but let it be a time that you commune with Jesus. Think about, is there anything in your life that uh, is pushing you away from him, that is between you and him? Think about those things and be thankful for what he has done for you, that he sent his son to die so we could do what we're doing right now, so we could worship, so when we die, we have a place to go and spend forever with him. So I'm gonna let you think about that. I'm gonna give you a moment, and then I'm going to pray, and then we'll take communion together. Father God, thank you for what you do for us. We thank you that you gave your son to die for us. And uh, I just pray that as we take communion every week, that we think about those things. Father, let us think about the things in our lives that draw us close to you. But Father, help us to get rid of the things that push us away. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. His body broken for you. His blood spilt out for you. As we come to the offering, I want to say thank you. Thank you for your giving. And there's many ways to give. And if you go to 
at lincolnhillschristian.com forward slash give. It will tell you those many ways. Tithing is a reminder that God is the supplier of everything we have. It is also God's personal invitation to experience an outpouring of blessing in each of our lives. In Malachi 3.10, God essentially says, Go ahead, I dare you, see if you can outgive me. And as we give today, we want to think about that. We want to think about how we can give to God's ministry and the blessings that he has already given us. Let's pray for the offering. Father God, thank you again for this day. We thank you that we get the opportunity to give to you and your kingdom. And Father, I just pray that you use that money uh, the way that you want, the way that's needed. Whatever we need in our community, whatever we need to do, Father, I pray that you take that money and you help us use it in that way. We love you. We thank you for everything that you do for us, all the blessings that you give us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Do not take your money out. This is real. Okay, if there's one takeaway other than a plus 400 celebrate, Bear Stearns is not in trouble. I mean, if anything, they're more likely to be taken over. Don't move your money from Bear. That's just being silly. The closing numbers on the markets today. At one point, the market fell uh, as if down a well over 700 points. Well, Apple shares are just getting hammered this morning. We're down by between 3 and 4.5% generally across these markets. Let's talk about the speed with which we are watching this market deteriorate. We're red everywhere, essentially, down by 4 or 5%. We're down over 16%. Dow at the same time has fallen about 18%. The stock market is now down 21 percent. Because we're now down 43 percent. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Almost everything there completely wiped out. And the NASDAQ, everything and more has been completely wiped out. The Dow traders are standing there watching in amazement. I don't blame them. So last week I challenged you to be uh, little magnum PIs and go on a stakeout and follow where your money's been going over the last several months. We did this because we said that it is important for us uh, to have a reference point if we're going to be financially balanced and find stability in regards to our money. Achieving financial stability requires our focus. We also said that success in this area of our lives requires us uh, to make constant corrections. We said just like a cheerleader or a tightrope walker need to be able to make constant corrections in physical space to maintain balance, we also must fix our eyes on our financial target and be willing to make constant corrections as we navigate life. I mean, think about it. Our incomes can fluctuate from week to week. Uh, unexpected bills somehow find their way to our mailboxes uh, without warning. Emergencies can spring on us at a moment's notice, and so we must be able to respond accordingly. Last week, we also said that we need to have a clear objective. Physical balance requires a clear goal. So cross the tightrope successfully. Keep the pretty cheerleader from falling on her face. Keep your bike upright. Those are clear examples in the realm of physical balance. We too need to have a clear objective in regard to financial balance. So that's what we're going to talk about today. What is a clear financial goal? What is the one thing that we need to do in regard to our money? Is the right goal to take care of our families? If this is the case, there may be a lot of things that get left out or get unaddressed. Is the right goal to earn as much as we can? That, that sounds good, but remember, just because we earn a lot doesn't mean that we'll be able to manage what we earn well. Is the right financial goal to save as much as possible? Again, this is important and even necessary, but it may make being generous kind of an afterthought. Is the right goal to spend as much as possible? You know, maybe max out our credit cards. Guys, you can finally buy the gun that you've had your eye on or the tools you've been salivating over for months. Ladies, maybe you can go out and buy a, a purse or, or some shoes to match. Is, is that the right financial goal, to spend as much as we can? Or, or maybe the right goal is financial freedom. Is that, is that possible? Can we be financially free? What, what does that even look like? Fact is, we may not want to hear this, but 
pursuing any one or two of these good goals to the neglect of the others as if they were the ultimate goal will leave us imbalanced. So what's the compass? What's the north star? What's the guiding principle for what we should do in regard to our finances? What's the one thing, the one goal that eclipses the others um, in regards to finances? Jesus answers this question in the New Testament, but for today we're going to focus on a passage from the Old Testament. You see, a thousand years before Jesus came on the scene, a guy named David was the king over Israel. And toward the end of his life, uh, all his enemies had been defeated, and the kingdom that he reigned over was at peace, and his empire was the envy of all the other nations. And one day during this season of life, he, he thought to himself, you know, I've got it pretty good. Uh, I've got servants waiting on me hand and foot, fulfilling my every need, accomplishing my every desire. My palace is big, and it's beautiful, and it's luxurious, but God... The God who made all of this possible is still living in a tent. If you don't know the history, the Ark of the Covenant or the big wooden chest that contained the Ten Commandments and many other items that were important to the Jewish people were all inside a portable tent called the tabernacle. And the most important thing that you need to know about the Ark of the Covenant was in the Old Testament it represented the precise place where God's presence rested. It was the place where God would commune with the high priest of Israel. It was the place where God met with his people. And that ark was sitting in a tent in the middle of some field. And this was a thought that really bothered David. It kept him up at night. And so he decided that he was going to build a temple for God. One didn't exist before this time. But as David started to make the plans for this temple, for this beautiful structure, God stopped him and explained to him that he wasn't going to be able to let David build this temple because he, David, was a man of war and he had too much blood on his hands. Sometimes I'll notice that uh, Judah might be struggling with something and so I'll offer to help him and he'll say, uh, no, daddy, I do it. Perfect example of this happened just a couple weeks ago. Um, we were getting ready to have dinner, and he was climbing into his high chair, and I noticed that he was having trouble finding uh, the first rung there so that he could get seated. And so I go to pick him up, and he swats at my hand, and he says, No, Daddy, Judah do it, and he starts to go into meltdown mode. And, you know, as a really mature, level-headed adult, I said, Well, fine, I don't care if you eat or not. Yeah, my... Uh, Parent of the Year Award is in the mail, I'm told. But maybe you can relate to that. You've tried to do something nice or you've tried to be helpful to someone and your good intentions are met with resistance or maybe even met with hostility. So you say something like, well, fine, you're on your own. Sorry I bothered you with my friendship. Sorry I cared so much. And Then we go off and we just pout for a little while. Well, David didn't respond to God like a little child. He didn't get upset. He didn't throw a tantrum or pout. He never uttered a well fine God. He didn't petition him to try to change his mind or convince him that the facts that he had were all wrong and he was just mixed up. No, because David genuinely cared about God. He genuinely loved him and wanted to honor him with his temple. He said, okay. That's fine. I don't have to build the temple. I'll let my son Solomon build it. Then David went and made all the necessary arrangements and preparations. He hired the builders and raised the money and cast the vision. But he was totally comfortable to let his son finish the project and see it to completion. When the temple was finished, it was considered one of the wonders of the ancient world. Before the creation of this marvelous structure, David prayed this prayer. And what we're going to see in this prayer is key to understanding how David thought about his wealth and the goal he had for his money. First Chronicles chapter 29 verses 10 through 14 say this, David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly saying, praise be to you Lord, the God of our father Israel from everlasting 
to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. Take a second to think about what David is affirming here. I mean, his country is the envy of all the other countries. He's at a place where things are peaceful, and, and yet he's saying, God, everything is yours. Not only does everything belong to you, but everything comes from you. Your hands are the source of power, prestige, and provision. You deserve the credit for everything we have. Fact is, I think David was really on to something here in this passage. And our goal should be to honor God with all that we have because everything belongs to Him. Now, maybe you grew up in a church or in a church tradition where it was customary to give 10% of what you had, or what the Bible calls a tithe. Now, let me just say this from a church perspective or from the perspective of, you know, the preacher. That sounds great. If every Christian and every church started giving 10% of what they have, you'd see preachers going into Holy Spirit convulsions, and they'd be hyperventilating, they'd probably be crying. They'd definitely be on the phone before the closing prayer, calling contractors and coordinators to get their facilities updated. Put simply, 10% sounds great to church folks, to church leaders, but that's not the point of this message, and it's not the point of this series. This series is not about trying to twist anyone's arm into giving more. This series is about trying to help us find financial stability and balance so that we can be examples of peace and confidence to those around us who are worried and fearful. The thing about this 10% system is it would be really easy to say, all right, here you go, God, here's your 10%, now get off my back. I'm going to do what I want with the other 90%, and you really can't tell me what to do anymore. Just leave me alone. You've gotten your cut. I gave you your money. And oh, by the way, I gave you 10% of the gross, not 10% of the net. So don't come barking up this tree for any more. Find somebody else. You got what you were owed. But does this kind of thinking really honor God? I mean, can you honor God with a percentage or is he worthy and deserving of more? A month or so back, uh, our family, we were having a, a lot of trouble in regards to cars. It seemed like every day there was a different car that had something new wrong with it. Uh, in fact, there were certain weeks where if you passed our house, our front yard looked like a used car lot. There were so many cars in our driveway that I was afraid that the police were going to show up one day thinking up they were busting busting up some kind of a, a party that was going on during the quarantine. That's how concerned I was about the number of cars that were in my front yard. Now, uh, over that time frame, we had folks who lent us cars um, so that we could get from home to work and from place to place, and it was really super helpful, and it was an amazing blessing. We're so thankful for that. But let me ask you a question. Uh, when someone loans you something, how much of that thing do you expect them to take care of? So in this case, someone loans me a car, how much of that car do you expect that I'm going to take care of, right? Uh, put another way, if I were return, to return the car that I borrowed to the individuals who loaned it to me, and the inside was full of holes and it was tattered and maybe there were burns in the seats or maybe it smelled like rotten milk and it, just, it was just really nasty, don't you think they'd have a reason to be upset? Well, of course they would, right? But suppose I say, well, yeah, maybe the inside doesn't look so great. Maybe I trashed it. Maybe I disrespected it. But I did wash the outside, and I filled it up with gas, and 
After all, the inside is just a percentage of the car. Just relax. Well, we don't think like that. When, when it comes to lending something to someone else, we don't think in terms of percentages. We want them to take care of the whole thing that we lend out. This is how God views our stuff. And according to David, God has loaned us everything that we have. We can't just pay him off with a percentage. That misses the point entirely. The point or the goal when it comes to managing our finances and being in balance with our money is to honor God with all that we have. When it comes to buying or selling, saving or giving, it should all be run through the filter of how does this honor God because it's really all His. I'm just borrowing it for a season. He's just loaned it to me. I need to use it well and take good care of it. Now, someone might say, well, Frank, hold on, here's, here's the thing. If I let God have whatever He wanted, He may take more than I'm willing to give. So, um, back at Christmas time, uh, Ryan and Lacey got Judah a guitar for Christmas. And I got to tell you, it's probably his most prized possession in the entire world. He loves it. He's always playing it. Um, sometimes he'll leave it out and I'll pick it up and I'll even strum around on it a little bit. And when he sees me playing with it, he'll immediately come up to me and he'll say, no, dad, Judah's tar, and he'll try to take it. And because it's his most prized possession and I think it's kind of cute that he wants to go play it, I'll let him take it after he uses his nice words. But let me ask you a question. Suppose uh, I wanted the guitar from him. Do you think there's anything that he could do to keep me from taking the guitar from him? Now, don't miss this. If God wants something from us, he doesn't need to wait for our permission or our surrender. He can take it any time he wants. The God that we can keep from taking our stuff is a tiny, tiny God, not the creator and sustainer of the universe. Now, someone else might say, well, God doesn't really need more of my stuff, does he? And to that, I would say, that's true. He doesn't need more of our stuff. God doesn't want something from you. God wants something for you. Remember, God is a giver. Think about the one passage of Scripture that literally every Christian has memorized. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that He, what? That He gave. God's not interested in taking something away. God doesn't want His people led astray. Believe it or not, there is a freedom, a sense of peace, a feeling of relief that comes from saying, God, you can have whatever you want. It's all yours already, and I couldn't keep it from you anyway, so I won't make you take it. Here, you can have whatever you want. I trust you. We weren't created to hold on to our stuff forever. And if you've ever lifted weights, you probably know this to be true. If you've ever held a 25-pound weight in your hand, you know that it's manageable for a time. You know, you hold it tight because it's a little bit heavy. But after a while, your, your grip gets really tight and it gets a little bit more challenging to hold. Your knuckles start to throb a little bit. And then you start adding weight. Let's say you add to 30 or 35 or 40 pounds. What you know is holding on to this is unsustainable. And the moment you decide to take that weight and set it down, there is immediately a sense of relief. Why? because we were not designed, we were not created to hold on to anything forever. So what should we do? How should we live? How does managing our money and our finances look? What, what can we take away from today? We need to develop the habit of asking God how to honor Him with everything that we have. And the fact is He'll probably answer each of us a little bit differently. To the free spirits among us, he'll probably say, you need to save a little bit more. You're generous with what you have, but you haven't prepared very much for the future. And that doesn't, that doesn't really honor me. That's a, a little bit irresponsible. He'd probably tell 
uh, some of us that we need to spend less, that we make enough, but we throw it away on things that really don't matter very much. I mean, how many toasters can one family have? How many shoes can one person wear at a single time? I mean, didn't you just buy an iPhone last year? I know you can afford it. The question isn't whether you can afford it, he'd say. The question is, does it honor me? He'd probably tell some of us that we need to give more. We've saved and stockpiled and and pinched penny after penny, and that's great, but we've overlooked people along the way. God would probably tell those folks, look, I've put all kinds of people and opportunities in your path so that you could bless them, and too often you've ignored those people and those opportunities, and that doesn't honor me. Think about all the things that we trust God with. We trust God with our kids and their future. We trust Him with our family and their health. We trust Him with our salvation and where we'll spend eternity. Think think about this. These are big things. We can't control a single one of them. And we say, God, I trust you. If we can trust God with these things, shouldn't we be able to trust Him with our money as well? All this stuff that we have, all the things that we hold dear, all the things we've worked so hard for are going to someone else one day. Right now, we have a choice about what that looks like. Right now, we can choose a balanced life and make our goal to honor God with all that we have for as long as we have. And if we'll commit to doing that, to honor God with all that we have for as long as we have, we will be well on our way to financial stability and steadiness. And here's the thing, if you're not there yet, that's okay. And none of us are gonna get there overnight. But if we will make it our goal to honor God with all that we have for as long as we have and continue to follow our money wherever it's going and be willing to make those constant corrections as they are needed, we will get there. And as we get there, we will be able to comfort and counsel those who've had their entire worlds turned upside down. Or put simply, by bringing balance to our finances, we will be able to help others fall in love with the real Jesus and make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. I hope you're finding this series encouraging and helpful. Please know that if you've been giving thought to following Jesus and you're not sure what your next step is, you can always reach out to us. Maybe you uh, have got something going on in your life and you just like someone to pray with you or pray for you. Know that we would be honored to do that. All you need to do is email us at info at lincolnhillschristian.com or send us a private message on Facebook and we'll be in touch with you. Again, please know that we are here for you and that we love you and we can't wait to be with you again. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us so, so immensely. Help us to recognize that everything we have ultimately comes from you, that you are the author, creator, and sustainer of all things. Father, just help us to be good stewards, to honor you with what we have. Father, help us to have the eyes that you do. Help us to see opportunities around us to glorify your name and grow your kingdom. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. To Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily I surrender surrender all all to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. To Jesus I surrender, make me 
Savior, holy thy. Let me feel the Holy Spirit truth. We know that thou art mine. I surrender all. I surrender. today that we are just in full submission and surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. We want to thank you guys for being here with us today. Uh, we want to just invite you back tonight with uh, our student hangout with Alex at six o'clock. Uh, it's just always a fun time. And uh, then we just want to encourage you as well just to continue with our online engagements that we're doing through the week beginning on Tuesdays um, at uh, 630 uh, with our teachings there. And uh, we just want to let you know that we love you guys. We miss you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. Uh, real soon.